All right. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at today's webinar, Staying Strong with Intellectual Property IP, in short, Intellectual Property Protection. My name is Pei Wen and I head Enterprise Engagement at IPOS International, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore or IPOS. So as a group, we work to transform Singapore future as a global hub for intellectual property creation, commercialization, and management. We support innovative enterprises, many from startups and SMEs, public agency and individuals to capitalize on your intangible assets and IP to grow and scale. So to achieve this, one of our key priorities is to equip our innovation community with the important skills and knowledge to leverage your most valuable resources, which is your intangible assets. So in the race to market, there are many IP needs and challenges that companies encounter but may not anticipate, whether expanding overseas, protecting your rights, or collaborating to drive innovation. And that's where we come in. So IP Expert Series is a quarterly webinar series where our IP experts will share real-world know-how and best practices on IAIP management to overcome challenges. So each quarter, we spotlight a different industry from biomedical science to engineering, ICT and media, fintech, agritech, and food tech. So you can look forward to learning more about the issues and challenges facing different sectors and technologies. And so today, our topic is on IP protection, which is a very important step if you want to leverage your IP to grow. This edition spotlights the information and communications technology, in short, ICT and media industry, and is an associated event for IP Week at SG 2022, which is happening next week. So before we start our discussion with our speakers today, let me invite you to watch a short introduction video. Every business has its competitive edge until it's no longer theirs alone. So how do you protect what makes you unique? Let's look at Aiden, inventor of the Moodwear Mirror that picks your perfect outfit based on your mood. Like most businesses, Moodwear has many different intellectual property and intangible assets which help build value, manage risks, and achieve business objectives. Among the most common forms are trademarks, which protect the identity of goods and services. This covers names, logos, and other distinctive, non-descriptive aspects. Registered designs help to protect the external appearance of products and even 2D designs applied to items. Patents protect innovations that solve an industrial problem in a new and improved way. Innovations must prove to be novel, new and original, inventive, not obvious, capable of industrial application, have utility. Last but not least, copyright protection covers all words, pictures, illustration and music, even extending to software code. With so many ways to protect an invention, hmm. how can Aiden prioritize what IP rights to secure? Since Moodware's key advantage All right, so this forms a very good introduction of what are the IPs or intangible assets that we will talk about later. And if you're interested to watch the whole video, uh, the entire video, right, feel free to go to IPOS International website or our YouTube channels. All right, so joining us today are IP experts, Mr. Dixon So from CHP Law and Mr. Victor Neal from Reverse Car uh, corporations. Let me first introduce the speaker okay, before we go into proper. Okay, maybe I'll see Victor first. So let me introduce Victor. Hi, Victor. So Victor, uh, Mr. Victor Neo is the co-founder, deputy board chairman and group uh, chief executive officer of Reverse Corporations, which owns a portfolio of companies engaged in technological innovations and business transformation solutions in the Asia Pacific region. Guided by his robust executive vision and exceptional organization strategy, Reverse grew from a homegrown startup of five employees to an award-winning B2B technology firms listed on Singapore Exchange within nine years. With Victor's business acumen and eye for opportunities, Reverse entered new verticals such as AI-driven cybersecurity, media tech, and metaverse, demonstrated capability in regional and built strategic ventures that reshape industry dy dynamics. Under his leadership, Reverse boosts a dynamic corporate culture focused on R&D and value chains Augmentation. Welcome, Victor. Hi, thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, we'll hear more from you later. 
Yeah. And so we have our IP expert. Uh, let me introduce Mr. Dixon. So, so Dixon is a regular speaker on speakers on IP commercialization and IA management at major international IP events. And Dixon views IP as the celebrations of human achievements and advocates an approach of designing commercial growth strategy centered around these intangible assets to help business realize tangible gains. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Yep. Let me continue. As a former in-house counsel with the C Group, Garina and Shopee, specializing in IP and commercial dispute resolution, and subsequently, my ex-colleague, <laughs> the Deputy Director, IP and Head of Legal at IPOS International, Dixon has years of experience helping a variety of business sectors explore available IP strategy, particularly in the field of architect, food tech, fintech, AI, esports, e-commerce, and media. And this is why we invite both of them into today's webinar. Hi, Dixon. Thanks for hello, joining. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Okay, we will ask you more questions later, okay? But let me brief the audience first. As a host, I would like to brief you that in the midst of the presentation, if you have any questions to ask our speaker at any time, please don't ask them first, okay? Please type your questions using the Q&A function on this platform and we'll get them answered during the Q&A segment. And so for this webinar, we are running it a bit different from our usual style. So instead of, you know, Victor giving his sharing and then Dixon giving his sharing, right? Today's webinar will be a full panel discussion whereby I will be the one posting interesting questions on behalf of our audience um, and questions that I think the audience will be interested to know. And so these two experts will enlighten us. All right, so before we get into the first discussion topic, um, can I get everyone to help me with this poll questions? A very interesting poll question. All right, so which of the below offers the strongest level of protection? And if you realize, right, this tree symbol, the first thing that comes to your mind should be trademark. So maybe while you are answering, answering this poll question, I would like to ask Victor. So Victor, as a business owner, what's your understanding about this tree symbol? Were you ever confused? Um, okay, good question. <laughs> okay, um, first of all, I think based on uh, this tree uh, symbol, right? Uh, many a times it's very commonly being seen in the, in the market and uh, especially in the, uh, uh, when you encounter those brands, right? Where, where you see TM, or when you see a, a R or in the website, you see a C. So um, many a times we may be mistaken that uh, trademark may be really being trademark. Or maybe trademark is actually being <laughs> trademark, right? So there's a confusion here where definitely Dixon will be the best person to, to, to share more. But of course, uh, based on my uh, understanding and also my experience, and, and I do also support a lot in terms of uh, filing for trademarks, it's very important. Um, what I gather is trademark can be a trademark only. Trademark can also be being a real trademark being filed for registration already, right? But the thing in most important is about uh, uh, once you see your R, then you don't play with it because that is really the real ones, right? Okay, oh. so the R is the strongest level of protection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so maybe let's review the poll results and see whether, you know, people get it correctly. Okay. Oh, not bad. Okay, so I don't know the correct answer. Okay, I mean, I know the correct answer, but let me just pass it over to Dixon. Dixon, maybe you can educate us. What is the difference between these three symbols? Okay, <clears throat> just let me run it through this way. So from the trademark perspective itself, right, you will often see TM and R. The difference is TM basically means your mark you're using as a trademark. You're putting a signal to the world you're doing that, but it's not registered. One is registered under the uh, trademark law, uh, law of the country itself. You have the entitlement to put an R there to signal to the world, like what Victor said, let's, uh, let's respect that. So that's one way to look, look, look at it. Now, from the legal perspective itself, um, the rights of uh, the TM, like unregistered mark and trademark are quite similar. Uh, I would say that from my experience is that, that when it comes to enforcement, right, when your mark is unregistered, there'll be more work involved. So your cost of uh, enforcement will uh, go up kind of um, correspondingly. So that's one part. When you see a C itself, largely it's copyright. Now, there is something that I think is less discussed in, 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 uh, in the commercial world or legal world in a sense. You'll see that a lot of trademark itself sometimes it come with a logo. We call it a device mark uh, professionally. So when you see the, the when you see that itself, right? Because it's it's, it's really an expression also. Sometimes you, uh, in certain certain ways, you can view it also as a copyright. 
by itself, but uh, that's a very technical way of why you're adopting that position. Um, I wouldn't go too much into here, but generally copyright refer to expression. Uh, you will see uh, lyrics, um, songs, uh, movies, books, those, uh, and you'll see sometimes in slides that we, we, we kind of uh, de develop along the time, we can put a C there. It's to basically signal that actually, okay, we own the copyright, please respect that. All right. So, so if I have a logo or I have a brand name, I can actually put TM first without registering it. And once I register it and get it granted, then I'll change it to R. But mm. both of them give me some kind of level of protection, even a TM mark. It's just that if it's easier for you to fight a war <laughs> if one day, right, if you are really registered. All right, so yeah. I hope this very simple question, actually we got this, we, we often uh, get these questions uh, from a lot of the companies. So I hope this actually helped to answer certain questions. So maybe let me post um, the next question. To, uh, maybe to Victor first, we'll be interested to hear from you from a business anchor. Why is IP protection important to any company? Um, yeah, so based on from the business uh, perspective and commercial perspective, of course, uh, let me share uh, about a real uh, experience that happens to uh, my company 10 years ago, right? almost 10 years ago. So um, a lot of times, right, um, you know, while we are so, uh, so engrossed of uh, running the business, we actually neglected or we actually never take into consideration of protecting uh, what, we have, what we have done or maybe perhaps we have infringed someone, right? Or we always have a kind of uh, uh, thoughts that we are always very lucky, right? So that really happens to me uh, 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 almost 10 years ago when there was one incident where, because we predominantly we do a lot of tailor-made uh, uh, applications for the customers, mm -hmm. right? So suit, uh, suit to the exact requirements of what the customer wants. So because of this, right, the risk of uh, infringe, infringement will come in very high. So, uh, uh, and that really happens to, to me uh, back then when, when we, we when especially when we, we actually want a job, in, you know, uh, uh, a job that is uh, uh, publicly known, right? So because of that, um, uh, someone knocked onto the door of my customer. Right, because of apparently, of course, right. He he lost to us uh, during during uh during the bid, and he locked to onto onto my customer and said, "Hey, your uh the, the the company that you you have appointed has infringed our solutions. Right, we have the right to claim against you." So that was exactly what happened, and the customer, of course, you will know, pass everything to me. And say, "Hey, uh, uh, this is your uh, this is your problem. This is your matter. Please solve it." Uh, uh, we have we we as customer we have uh, uh, is 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 not our duties to ensure this is not in fridge right so uh, but luckily because it's, it was my first time and also because of that time it actually uh, brings me to you know the understanding of uh, more about uh, this IP protection so um, luckily I I have uh, uh, managed to 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 look for someone else uh, IP specialist at that time to support me in terms of uh, uh, um, looking into more in details about the infringement. And also, <clears throat> also luckily, um, after looking through all the claims and, and you know, in all patents, there is there's always a claim portion. Okay, so this is something important to note. Um, we, and we realized that uh, we didn't infringe, right? We didn't infringe. So lucky enough, you know, we saved the money, you know, we, we exchanged a certain kind of uh, 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 of course, are uh, represented by lawyers and etc. We are seeing certain kind of letters, so we are not, we are not infringed. But however, uh, one of the thing in terms of commercial wise, we do take note is that while we are not being infringed, we save the money, but we actually lost the confidence from our customer. So that is really the most painful uh, uh, experience, right? We we were so we were so um, uh, high up back then, right? Uh, so so kind of. Uh, uh, recognized by our customers back then, but because of one issue like this, we were we were kind of being uh, 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 pushed out all right to the rock bottom, and because of that, we actually lost the customer for the whole entire one whole year, mm. and they are actually our la largest customer, right? So so the uh, the 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 um uh 
so in this scenario, we, we, uh, I just want to like to share that uh, sometimes it's not just about the money. Of course, it's important for sure. But the business recognition, reputation uh, uh, is the most important. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so actually, I'm interested to know. So, in this situation, you were lucky, lah. <laughs> I mean, like if you know it found out that you really infringe others, then I think the consequences will be a lot more serious. Maybe I will ask Dixon, right? So, in this in this case, right? How can a company actually protect themselves from getting from from infringing others? Let's let's talk on the on this topic about infringing others first. Um, I think my experience so far over the years, right? Very, very. I mean, after I mean, after I think uh, mid two thousand, my experience on the ground is is that very. Uh, it's not very common that you see pe that people deliberately infringe somebody. You would see that some uh, they would try to work around and all this based on the patent claims and stuff. You you see that, um, but you don't really see them actively as like, I want to infringe this guy. It's like because everyone knows <clears throat> IP right is quite well respected uh, in most part of the world, and there are repercussion consequences to that. So one of the things I usually recommend the client is that if they're going into a certain joint venture or a certain certain uh, collaboration itself, it's good to actually be very clear what are you bringing onto the table. It's probably good to actually scan the patent space a bit for indicative. It's like okay, how does it look like? Who's in the market itself? Are they uh, very active, or how 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 are they like? Uh, are they actually non-practicing uh, entities? Essentially, look, looking looking into um, guarding certain patent space. So by doing that itself, it gives you the advantage. It's like okay, I'm entering this, knowing this, this. I also know what my partner is bringing in. So it's a very clear kind of a approach. Uh, slightly different from the due diligence you usually see in uh, in, in uh, law firms, uh, simply because. Uh, I think we can safely say the past five to eight years has been a very rapid development in the IP space itself. You can see there's more uh, activities. There's also more awareness. So people go in and say, hey, uh, I'm going to do this. What, should I, what do I need to do? Who do I need to talk to? I see that in the market itself. So that's one thing. But companies itself, to help themselves, uh, definitely need to do the duty uh, in, in, in the manner that's uh, appropriate uh, for their develop product development or collaborations. Yeah. Right. So from a I from a company <coughs> perspective, when they want to expand to new <coughs> new market or you know, when they are launching new product and services, it's always good at the R and D or the planning stage to actually look out, do some kind of like IP due diligence to make sure that you're not stepping onto other people's territory or you know, Absolutely. or you know, like I can share a good example <coughs> on like you know, a trademark case whereby you know, I was talking to a company and the company said that, you know, based on my business plan, I'm going into five different countries with my branding and, you know, I spent a lot of money on branding. Mm -hmm. And so in the midst of them going to that country, right, um, they realized that actually their trademark has been taken up in one of the country. So then, mm -hmm. oh, back to the drawing board mm -hmm. because right now, there's only two options, right? One would be either you buy <laughs> over the trademark in that particular country or you go into the country with a different brand, which is different from the rest of your market entry strategy. Or, you know, the third option is that you rebrand everything and make sure that, you know, there's a consistency across the brand name. So, so uh, this is on top of just, you know, ensuring infringing others, right? But having that preparation uh, before you go into a country, a uh, new I, market is important. I, I think you touched on a very good point, Paywen. Preparation <clears throat> is very important. What I find that in most startups I see, there's a lack of project planning beyond what they see in the product, right? So like you say, just taking an example on, 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 on trademark itself, uh, what we usually do is work a pre-filing assessment, which basically look at your mark, whether there's any, uh, that's comply with the local laws, for example, like Singapore law itself. Then we do searches across the region. So we look at where they're going to go in the next 18 months, we space it up for them. Recently, we have a situation whereby it's quite interesting. I never got this before in, in, in almost 20 years. It's, it's, it's whereby, whereby we, we were doing the search and clearance, right? We found uh, identical mark. So, so the same mark, same classes in seven classes in one jurisdiction, and that's it. So what we did, we, 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 we actually looked at the owner of the, of the mark in the other country because I just ascertained what, what was going on itself. Uh, because you're, you're right. You have a few options. One, you have identical mark. Either you bring them to court to invalidate the mark, which is an expensive, painful, and slow kind of uh, uh, exercise as we go, or you buy them over. 
or you get license from them, right? So or the final one, of course, is, is basically you want to do a rebrand. I think the big take back for everyone is, is that when, when you hit one of the market, right, it's not end the world. The idea is that if you're able to identify that early before you enter the market, you know who on the other side is and you identify, okay, that's a legit business. It's not it's just they happen to be, you share the same good taste on, on the market itself. And after that, you, you take it back to the table. It's like, okay, guys, what do we need to do? These are the right. few options. So in the end, the client decided to rebrand for one country only. All right. That saved him about six figure easily. Right, yeah. nice. Actually, this is also a very common uh, mm. question that we get uh, when we are working with SME. So I thought uh, it would be good to share. And yeah. so in that case, right, we are talking about infringing others. Let's go back to the basic. Mm. How about protecting ourselves from getting infringed. So maybe, uh, Dixon, you can continue, right? So how do you, you know, how can a company protect themselves from getting infringed? How can, how can they, what are the minimum IP protection that, mm. that, you know, a company can do? And maybe then we'll pass it over to Victor to share what has Revest done in this area. So Dixon. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe I'll start from this premise. So when you look at a company itself, right? It's very easy to be drawn into the assets that are registrable because these are easy, uh, easily uh, found in terms of literature online and everywhere else. Uh, people talk about them. But when I look at a uh, company itself, right, I put them in different buckets. So you have to have a different strategy uh, for different kind of assets supporting the same product. I'll give you an example of pattern. <clears throat> One of the problem patterns I see from commercially is that when you file a patent itself, right, your claim is only accurate of your technology as at the date you file the, your, 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 your patent application. But life doesn't stop, business doesn't stop, R&D doesn't stop. So we got all these things running at the same time and they are all moving pieces relating to the same product. So when you break it up into, into, into different parts, right, you are able to have clarity how to protect them. For example, there's a bucket called know-how. We talk about it a lot. But a part of this know-how are things that your competitors in the industry would know anyway, but you don't be helpful, tell them that it's inside. So you park it under know-how. These are things that are lower risk. You don't really, you want to make sure it doesn't assist your competitor to go over and above you, but you also want to, uh, you're not too worried about it if it goes up because everyone knows what it is anyway. Your second and third gen technology, you park it under trade secret. Harness the energy, wait for them to go. So you put it under trade secret. When you talk about trade secret, it's actually a lot of operation and legal components moving together, but at least when you see that clarity, this is my Gen 2, right? this is going to be a lockup piece until I'm ready to do. But in between, right, you will have interest, investors and things like that. You can't just stay there, oh, this is my trade secret, it's not going to work. So you sift out the information and you put one more block in called confidential information that actually can be protected under the cover of usually NDA or equivalent. That way, right, if this staggered model, right, you have a more comprehensive uh, way of uh, protecting your assets. The idea is very simple. If we focus on the registrable rights, right, then we are look we are missing out all the assets that support this product anyway. Right, right. So, so maybe Victor, or uh, are you doing what uh, Dixon has been saying? <laughs> maybe uh, you want to um, share your yeah. experience. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I think first of all is uh, uh you know, it, when 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 we talk about ID, uh, I, uh, IP protection and and talking about infringement, um, we we are here not to uh. Uh, go after someone that infringe us, right? The the whole entire uh uh interest is about protecting our company ourselves, right? To prevent uh you know ill intention, I would say you know uh, companies or so that is trying to knock onto your door to to claim against you, right? So that is the uh, the whole entire interest about how I mean uh, uh we are trying to protect our company when especially when we are actually expanding out of you know, uh, different kind of uh, jurisdiction. So I think the first, uh, ever since the, the, the incident happened, it, uh, I actually immediately adopt uh, I so-called an IP management strategy, right? So this is very important. And also at the same time, I believe that, you know, there are different uh, uh, agencies out there is actually supporting all these kind of initiatives. So I run through that, you know, coming up with certain processes, especially when it comes to uh, things that we, 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 we think it's important or things that we think that, you know, is something very new because we do a lot of, a lot of uh, innovations. That is where we will then uh, uh, put in more uh, time to, to look into to 
the solution itself or the 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 idea itself. So now it comes when it comes to this, right? Uh, uh usually if you really want to file for certain uh IPs, for example, right? Um, there's different ways of doing that. Of course, you know, I mean, one way that what I actually also usually practice is that we call it the IP fencing. So we fence it around so that uh, uh sometimes it's also a, a little bit about commercial, right? It's because it's you know it's about business. Sometimes we may not want to uh, 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 patent the whole entire thing, right? We, we just patent uh, uh, around it so that uh, people, you are opening for people to come to, to, to you to partner with you for certain things, right? Yes. So that because they, they, they know that, you know, in order to reach number two, they have to go to number one first, right? So for example, if let's say uh, uh, TV, televisions, right? For example, your if you patent something that okay from a TV wise, you know it will show uh it will show a screen, right? But now it becomes a color screen. So in order to be a color screen, you have to go through the black and white voice or I mean the the screen itself. So the the, the initial thing of uh, of flashing out the the screen is already kind of a part of your, your patent. For example, okay. Um, the other kind of course of uh, Patent thing is more uh, for myself here is uh, usually I'll patent the concept. Yeah, concept is actually more relevant instead of patenting the process. Because pr process wise, uh, it's not saying that it's not good process, it's just to, to uh, give you more confidence and of course to protect you against people infringing you. But on a wider perspective, concept is a better way of, uh, of uh, patenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are the things that we will usually do and, and also to run through checks and all these things if uh, to make sure that you know, we at least we do a certain kind of due diligence when when come to uh, innovating new ideas. Right, right. I really like it when you say IP management. <laughs> so it covers the end to end, right? Really yeah. from the beginning to end. And yeah, your experience helps you a lot yeah. in this area. You know, you know, at this junction, right, I would actually, I have prepared a poll question really um, also uh, to, to, to check with the attendees, right? Uh, how would you respond to such questions like, um, and to test your knowledge? So if you can have that poll question on, you know, what do you need to align in your business, in your company before filing an IP application? How would you answer this question? I mean. So Dixon and uh, Victor share about the importance of IP protections and how you can look at it. So what would you need to align? All right, another 10 seconds, okay? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I think most people have the same answer. We can show the results. Right, so 82% um, of uh, the response says that all of the above. So Dixon, any view on this results? I, I think I think this uh, perception of all of the above uh, is common in the market. Usually, when we meet clients, the firm we, we always ask, ask I always ask this question. With some of them, I uh, thought it was a bit hmm, why. Um, if you ever found an IP with me, let's say for my firm, come to my office. I said, is the IP related to your business? Business meaning that how you conduct business, what you do. Uh, how you get investment in or related to your revenue, like licensing revenue, advertising revenue, all this kind of stuff. If not related to either of them, right, then why are you filing it? The concept is very simple. IP is an asset, just like any asset. We not buy, you will not buy a house, well, serve the mortgage, pay the rates, and not expect it to, one, lift in it, or two, uh, extract an income from a lease from it. IP is exactly the same. Um... Personal, <clears throat> I think the other one was personal and valuation is a subsequent thing because <clears throat> you, you, you don't file things because I personally like it. IP is a commercial object uh, and a subject matter in, in commercial. So you actually align it with basically your revenue or business line. Secondary to that is like, why are you doing that? Because eventually you want to get a valuation. So that's useful. Or uh, it, it basically is also a personal emotive element to, to your business. Because a lot of people found it and it's like, you know, this is my baby. I, 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 I need to protect it. But the reality is, is that um, if you are a business and you are running, running a business itself, your main concern before filing an IP, IP application, right, is to align it to your business and revenue. Right. Absolutely. So, uh, 
at this junction, um, I was just thinking, should I give Victor that opportunity to ask Dixon a couple of questions since, you know, he's here already? <laughs> and I think from a business point of view, it would be interesting to see what our business owner has to ask our IP experts. So Dix, uh, Victor, any questions? Uh, yeah, I have one question for you, Dixon. Um, you know, there are, there are so many patents out there, right? I mean, in the, in the, in, in the world, I mean, everybody is fighting for, for patents, right? And... And we, to be also very realistic, we can't be checking every single uh, patents out there or definitely we will be missing out certain patents out there that, that is related to whatever things that you want to patent or you want to do, for example, right? So how does the law uh, uh, really helps us uh, or protect us when really comes a point that we really infringe, uh, but we actually have really already done our part of checking and all these due diligence, but we just miss that. Fair question. <laughs> okay, let me let me let me put it in two frame for you uh, in, in this way. Uh, from a dispute perspective itself, right? It's very seldom you will see a direct hit. It, shame not you see it. Pattern, I have not seen it yet. Close, yes, close to the claim, and then you you kind of shape it a little bit because that's a, uh, that's that's the whole thing itself. When 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 you when you uh, first start anything, right? You, you, you did the right thing to start protecting yourself, do some searches, you do what you can itself, right? So what does it give you? It gives you the clarity when you receive an action uh, from the other side itself. Based on what you have, you can work with a lawyer to actually look at two things, whether the cost of action can stand. If it does, uh, what's the prospect of success in defending against it? So that's the first frame itself. Now, in the unfortunate event that, that you get the, the jackpot, like, let's put it this way, uh, it, it, it put in mind that what you have done is not wasted. Because number one, dispute has many modes itself. It, it's not always a strict litigation model. There are many uh, differences to it. For example, you can put it on the mediation, uh, in a mediation which is actually more private, and people can talk about this. And with that itself, right, it assists you to actually get through to the other side. Look, this infringement is really, uh, I, I don't know how it happened, but this is what we have done. Look at this. Okay, because those things that you actually talk about in mediation itself are not, you can't use it in court anyway, unless both sides agree. Uh, uh, your lawyers will be able to, to guide you through in terms of how, what to disclose and what not to disclose during mediation, but it gives you an opportunity to get through to the other side. Look, I have done all this. If you were me, could you have done better? Then it moved the discussion to, from something, uh, to me, something maybe uh, probably more suitable or, or, or amicable for others to, 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 to for, for both sides to actually come to a, a, res, a resolution of the dispute. So that's one. Let's go on the full on arena in the courts itself. Um, but, but infringement is an infringement, you, you can't do much here and there. But I think when it comes to a discussion or rather a, a proposition about damages, it may, it may help you to build some narrative and also some positions that that, okay, despite the fact this is what it is, uh, this is what my client did before, uh, before it started anything, and this is my, what my client did immediately after uh, receiving a letter of demand or, or, or whichever it is, right? It would generally uh, help you in padding a position to lower the quantum of damage itself. But it really depends on, on the dynamic of the case on, on the two parts. So, it gives you some, at least you give you something, a leverage to actually uh, work with the other party to resolve this, this dispute. But when you have nothing, you scramble into it, then you will be trying to attend, uh, try to find too much information in a very short time to respond to, to a very uh, adversarial uh, situation. Yeah. I hope that answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a very uh, big topic. Yeah, mm. yeah. But I think, I think you give a very good cheese of it. I think, I think, uh, um, at the end of the day, it's about uh, uh, you have to do some work, right? Uh, due diligence first. I think that is very important. And that goes to the IP management. Definitely, it's very important. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if I can jump in to sell some Puyo, right? If you are talking about mediation, right? You can choose Singapore as the IP dispute resolution <laughs> and mediation center. There's some support um, going on. You can check out more information uh, on IPOR's website on this. Um, yeah, so when we talk about infringement, right, actually, one of the 
I would say one of the motive for people to really, uh, you know, I mean, one of the motive for people to, I would say, uh, issue a letter of demand and things like that is really because they wanted to see if there's any opportunity for licensing, right? Or any like uh, revenue generating opportunity. I mean, or, or to just ensure that people don't steal their market share. So with this, right, uh, I, I'll go into the next question. If Victor has no more additional questions. Any questions, additional questions from Victor? Uh, I have a very impromptu, but I think it should be an easy one for Dixon. <laughs> sure, I'll let you ask first. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So, I, I, um, you know, while we fought for patents and all this, uh, the, my first quick question is about, uh, is it a forever thing? Uh, or it has a time frame of, uh, you know, an X amount of years before that every, it's open up for everybody to use, right? My next uh, related question is about uh, uh, regarding trademark, right? For example, let's say, if, my, if the first question has an expiry, how about the trademark? Let's say I have a trademark of, say, uh, um, say Apple, for example, right? Is it a forever thing? Because since if the question of number one is there's expiry, how about trademark? Uh, okay. Um, for patent, there's a lifespan of 20 years, generally. And uh, once uh, it's done, then... Uh, that that technology is open for the public to, to use generally. Uh, Panadol is a good example. Trademarks are a bit different. Uh, first and foremost, they protect different things. I think I saw a question at the bottom uh, in, the, in the chat. It's like, when you put C and R together, same thing. Copyright is protect is protecting expression. Uh, trademark is protecting a batch of origin in business itself. Now, going back to the trademark part, uh, I think... Uh, you you need it's a, it's, you can say that it's, uh, it's, it's there's longevity in it beyond every other rights that's registrable, simply because it's a, it's, it's a, it has a ten years renewal requirement. It's a renewal requirement. Not it's not basically an expiry date of the trademark itself. So we have very old Coca Cola, I mean McDonald's, all these are old trademarks itself. So you renew it every ten years. So as long as you keep re renewing it, your rights will, will, will continue to build. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Dixon. I think this is a very quick one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I, and I think it's very useful or it's a very uh, a good question uh, to help everyone in this call. Um, and, okay, so back to my question, right? Actually, I wanted to ask, um, so we talk about a lot about IP protection and at the end of the day, business is all about making uh, revenues, right? So how can we leverage on IP protection strategy to gain competitive advantage? Maybe Victor, you want to share how your company actually, how does your IP management strategy actually helps your company to be better? Uh, the straight, uh, the straight, uh, uh, I would say answer to this is about, because once you do, once you actually start to have all this strategy, you immediately, first of all, you will, you will think, uh, give better confidence in terms of your business and revenue uh, plans, right? Again, earlier we mentioned about, you no, know, if things are not being planned and, and you are little part, you are just trying to salvage it, right? So I think this is the first thing is that you prevent you from uh, uh, going the wrong directions, right? Second of all, on, you know, on the commercial side, is also is that you give your, your business partners or, or, your, uh, or your potential customers or uh, in, in different jurisdictions or investors wise, uh, uh, a, a stronger confidence, a better confidence, and, and it also give you extra values to it, right, to the company perspective. So this is all the immediate positive and also benefits about adopting a very important IP strategy. Right, right. Yeah. This, this makes me recall of a company, uh, uh, a company Tauke, who I asked him, why do you want to patent this uh, technology? And he was like, yeah, because I want to show that, you know, it's mine, <laughs> or, you know, I'm the one created it. If I can get a pattern, it means it's new, it's innovative. And, uh, and, and you know what? It's actually very good marketing uh, strategy. La. I mean, a, a very good opportunity for any marketing strategy. Yeah, but I mean, uh, there's many other things, you know, to consider whether or not to pattern. Um, before I ask Dixon to share some tips, right? I want to share uh, one more poll question regarding to this. I um, wanted to ask, you know, the, the, the attendees, which of the following do you think is an IP-related revenue? Is it streaming fees, advertising fees, sponsorship, revenue that one derived from the deployment of the stock of IP commercially? Which one? Um, there's no right or wrong. It's just, you know, I wanted to sense what is the 
our sentiments on the ground. Okay, and another 10 seconds and we will show the answers. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's, let's reveal. All right, we see, okay, majority choose the last one. Hmm. Victor, a very good uh, statistics for you to consider <laughs> as a, you know, listed company. Okay, Nixon, so which of the following is an IP related revenue from our IP experts point of view? Okay, I, I look at it in this way. I mean, some of you know also, uh, I, when I was doing my, my A-levels itself, for some reason, I did FCCI, so I'm kind of an accountant in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I choose another job. So when you look at books itself, right, how you labor it, uh, uh, everything is revenue itself. But when you come to a company itself, what I see itself, you, statistically, right, they, they go beyond the accounting labels itself. And they look at, okay, so these are my IP assets. What feeds from it? So when we are looking at what is IP revenue, it's actually basically based on your assets itself. Now, today's world is more about, it's not just about registrable rights, it's also about non-registrable rights, like your data itself. Now, data can be a passive income if you structure it properly. And what happened here is that that itself is an IP income, or you call it intangible asset income, IA income, whichever it is. Whatever is attached to your IP assets, right, and, and it creates a revenue stream, that is IP income itself. Now, now let's talk a bit about advertising and streaming uh, what revenue is. So they are traditionally uh, attached to uh, uh, what I call the IP before you actually can get the, get, get the money in anyway. I think what we are trying to, to, to say here is that today is not, these are just some of the example. They are more than just these two when it comes to revenue stream that's created, created from IP itself. So I think that's that's the reason why I think why we actually structured the question in this in this model. Yeah. Right, right. I mean like the common one would be IP licensing, right? So yeah. people getting a raw T mm. from you and mm. uh, and I see <clears throat> good revenue stream from that mm. particular uh, strategy. So mm. all right, any actually let me now now they mentioned licensing itself. I think we share something with you guys. I mean, since I got back to practice recently, I've got, got done a few models quite interesting in a sense of like where the party goes in, right? The licensing, cross-licensing itself did not create a dollar and cent income stream. It created a cross-asset reliance model whereby it, the whole purpose is to grow more IP assets for both parties itself. Because the longer route is that you will get money from it subsequently down the road. But at this stage itself, right, the licensing itself, it goes on based on value and also asset creation. So when you guys are looking, you guys are looking at, at, at uh, anyone's looking at, at uh, licensing itself, right? Don't just focus on the dollar and cent. Look at what are the output that's possible in this, in this collaboration or this licensing model itself. Sometimes you are licensing to someone to build the capabilities and you can pack the, 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 the value or even dollar and cents, right, subsequently later down the road anyway. So the licensing model are quite flexible and I like it in a sense that it creates a lot of possibilities also. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I think that's very good um, advice. You know, I'm distracted by the list of questions coming in. I think we we leave some time for the questions. So um, so maybe we go into Q&A directly. Um, there's a lot of our questions relating to our first example, the trademark thing. Um, I think trademark is a very common IP uh, when we talk about. Actually, to me, trademark filing is not expensive, so it's always good to do it. Um, so we have this question. I thought it's pretty interesting. Um, the, the question is, if I register a trademark in Singapore only, but launch my app globally, can I put the, the registered sign or TM sign next to my brand name, which is seen by global audience? And I have two questions on this, actually. Two related questions. So I registered in Singapore. Definitely in Singapore can put an R, right? <laughs> but how about other countries? Maybe I'll take this one, Pei Wen. Um, thank you for your question. I, I, think, I think generally that is acceptable, acceptable model. Let me bring this conversation a notch forward in that sense. When we, when we, a lot of time people come to me, I had it recently, this guy's a game company and say, I'm going to launch it globally uh, in two weeks time. I want to file in all the countries. So it's 194 countries or so. And I sat there for a while, I just smiled to myself. It's like, what a good day. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I told him it's like, it's like, okay, 
So calm down. I know you're excited, but let's let's look at this this way. What is your business plan in the next 18, 24 months? And he was a bit like, okay, which lawyer asked you this? I said, me. I asked you this. Why? In the next 18, 24 months, right, you can see priorities. In the digital world of application uh, of business itself, right, while your, your, your general content is available all around the world, but what, when you move, whether you move commercially is how much you put effort to move it on the ground too. Mm. So what you see in the next 18, 24 months are the main uh, primary uh, market. And perhaps by then in the 18 months, you'll think about your secondary market where you can skip to from your primary. Say your primary market is in Thailand, in maybe six to eight months from your stabilization itself, you would be looking at, um, I don't know, Vietnam, Laos, that region itself, because it's a neighboring market itself. So by doing this, right, you will be able to chart out how to file it strategically and where to move in the next 18 to 24 months. The rest of it, we can look at it as, as it is. Most people are worried about, oh, what if I lose this market and that market? In the digital world, unfortunately, it's not totally possible to cover all the country at one go because it burns your books. You have the same dollar itself, right? You need to decide as a startup, even like, like, like Victor, who's a listed company, where am I going to spend that dollar? IP protection is important, but you also need to be sensible about it. I mean, us lawyers, we're very happy. We, 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 we enjoy the kind of support for the uh, industrially and say a lot for my, for, for my counterparts. But we also need to put some sensibility in it. How do I file it? What structure I go and plan it? I like to work with the CFO in, usually in this conversation also to understand the pressure point and let's work on a, a, a schedule that everyone can be, rely on and work on the strategy, whether go through Madrid or Paris or whatever otherwise, to protect the, the, the key markets itself. While you are launching all around the world, you may not be able to protect it. Or in other places itself, because it's content, right? Copyright may be protectable anyway, right? right? So, so there's a bigger idea there. But as a legal concept itself, where you don't have a, a registration in that country, right? TM is possible, but bear in mind, TM, uh, what you call common law marks generally, unregistered mark. It's a common law concept. So unless we are going to the Commonwealth, uh, it doesn't really work so well when, when, when they are non-Commonwealth country. Uh, I wouldn't know everything in the world, but regionally, I, I would say most, 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 of most places will, will work decently. Right. So mm. from a business point of view, I mean, what, the answer is, the, I mean, the question is, why do I want to protect that, that particular trademark? So uh, it's more of like, if I enter that market, if I don't register in that market and the other person <coughs> or another company decided to use my brand name and use mm. my trademark, they can actually file it there and then I lose it to them, right? Because I didn't register in that country and therefore it can be easily sort of like taken. Even business, if I have the TM mark? I think it's business sensibility. I, I know where you're coming from and I have a lot of those questions coming to me on a pretty much daily basis. The reality is that um, it, 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 when you are looking at your product itself, you need to look at the market you're going into. Some market you may not even bother, right? For gaming itself, you're looking probably like, like maybe uh, the CIS region, Brazil region become very important to you because of the big number of gamers. But if say you are doing that itself, but certain market itself, like maybe uh, some of the more quiet uh, jurisdiction, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Africa in places uh, where, where but there's lesser connectivity or like internet and things like that, you, they, they, they may not be that important in the sense, it doesn't reach your business plan anyway. Right. So maybe doing something over there, uh, but it doesn't really affect your mainstream business because the reality is businesses can operate in a certain, certain, certain fashion, certain range. Right. right. We can add on yeah. to this uh, on the commercial side, right? Mm. I mean, dollar and cent is very important. So earlier, I think this uh, I mentioned one thing is very important is that um, while we file for patent, it's always about business and revenue. So doesn't mean that you know. Uh, of course, on the book basis, ten year series, right? I mean, you can file for everything. Is is the best, right? But this is not going to work that way in business, right? So it's very important to really identify uh, which country or which uh, uh, potential jurisdictions that you want to and you file that and that is also based on your plans or business plan now now when, when you file for patent that already shows that you know even those places that you never file for patent right yes maybe perhaps people can do something on, on, on in that country but remember maybe that country is, is a, maybe a country that the market is not big enough and eventually when you are focused on the places that you want to focus and you already file a patent you can always go back to the countries that you haven't filed but you haven't file anyway but your, your business is already big enough that you are able to compete there. 
doesn't mean that someone some, that you never uh, uh, patent it and you let someone to start it that you're in the losing end. No, you can always go back again when you're when your big markets that you already conquer and you start to conquer the small ones, right? So it doesn't mean that you, 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 it's, it's always uh, important to cover everywhere. No, the important is the, the places that is big enough for you to, 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 to enter first. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so when we look at the two questions, the, the answer is, um, you know, uh, if you have registered or in Singapore and you're a Singapore entity, you can put that R registered. If you are a bit more worried, put TM. But really, if you want to take some, or I would say legal, you want to have the proper legal rights, you have then have to register in that particular country, a uh, country that is big enough to make it worthwhile. Uh, yeah. So, so I think that would summarize, you know, the, the answer for this couple of questions. And because we are doing ICT and media industry, right? So we have a lot of audience from this side. And one of the, a couple of questions is asking about programming code because, uh, you know, so one of the questions is if I want to protect my protect programming codes using IP, do I use TM registered or copyright? Um, I, would, I would assume it's copyright, but what is the best way, Dixon, if you can uh, help? The best way is to put copyright mark in your source code. Ah. Uh, that is one of the th way itself. Um, like I said before, when we look at a situation, come and come to me and say, I want to enforce my IP right. The two basic things that we usually look at, one, what are your cause or causes of action? And based on the list itself, what's the prospect of success? So you, you mishmash a bit. So for uh, source code generally can say it's copyright, but it's not enough that it say, oh, that's my copyright itself. You have to show there's this, there's the, that there's an evidentiary requirement, etc. I won't go too much into that. What I see in the market, especially on gaming itself and some of the entertainment app, right? You'll see in the line of source code, there is some rubbish thing going on and, and things like that. So that's one model. Uh, something I've done before years ago, whereby if you guys have uh, know what Dota and Leo Legend is, it's like you start walking around in the forest and you click something, right? And you see, Piang, that's my mark. Right, so when it happens itself, right? So, that, so is that is that also a trademark uh, infringement? Also, so as I say, look at your product. There are different parts of it. Just because it's it's the software doesn't mean it's only one way to protect it anyway. Let's use a general example. Like hopefully that helps. <laughs> oh, interesting! <laughs> that would be hilarious, right? Imagine you know the player is trying to help you find out who's uh, well, not, or... not so hilarious for the defendant, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, interesting sharing. Yeah, so this is one way definitely they can uh you can do it. But you know, in some countries, right, actually copyrights needs to be registered. So we do have a question thing saying that if you protect your software with copyright, can we do we need to submit the entire code or just a portion of them? Is a smaller submission better because you know the way that yeah, because it's easier to be infringed. <laughs> I suppose it means that um you know, just like patents, right? When you register patents, right, the the information will be shown to everybody. I'm not sure about uh, registration of copyrights. Copyright registration is not required in Singapore because we don't have a regime. But there are other places uh, with copyright registration regime, uh, like Thailand is one of them, definitely. China is one of them. Uh, so, so that's one thing. So I'm just trying to figure out the question, to be honest. So, sorry, uh, Peng, what, what's the question again? The so question of... is, uh, if you protect, if you need to register copyright uh, mm. to protect the software, do, mm. should the applicant submit the entire source code or just a portion of the source code to be saved? Oh, uh, yes. This is always a hundred dollar, a million dollar question itself. <laughs> uh, I, I don't care about this. Uh, when I file uh, for copyright those days, right, it's actually to obtain... <laughs> publishing rights, uh, no, pu pu obtain publishing permits in certain countries in the region, like Vietnam, for example. So that's one part. When it comes to, uh, I, so other than outside that, I'm not so familiar with the fouling of uh, copyright for, for protection. I'm just using what uh, my common sense would tell me. You would want to basically be able to, to protect uh, what is important to you, right? So when you file for copyright protection, right, uh, you, you need to understand what, what it is. Like. I mean, so for example, like pattern itself, Victor Correct put it, sometimes we design some stuff just to go around it, but certain things remains to be trade secret. 
how you do it can be can be projected in different manner. Same thing comes with a software like this. We had to break up the component itself. What are the things that you think that, okay, uh, I need to make a statement in terms of this is my copyright, but certain things are really, really uh, your trade secret, very confidential and affect your business. You get exposed somewhere else. You don't want to put that in place outside your own heart. <laughs> and, and, and you will, of course, uh, use it. I mean, it, as I said, when you look, break down the product, there are different elements. Then you can decide what, what uh, protection strategy to go for. That's how I will approach it. Victor, your, your thinking? Uh, uh, no, I just uh, just want to add on is that uh, to remind everybody is that while we file for patents, right? Uh, uh, it's also uh, it's an art to, to file a patent, right? So it's very important to have really professionals, uh, you know, because whatever thing you file is, is public, right? So while you are trying to protect yourself, eventually you are revealing everything to the public, right? So, so the, it's an art when you want to craft something. So, you know, even when you want to protect your source code or whatever kind of thing, you, it's very important you know, how to craft it so that you know, whatever confidential or uh, really trick secret is being protected, not revealed in, the, in, in, in somehow. Yeah, so, so this is uh, just a reminder. Right, thank you for that. And I, I think one of the questions that I said we answered live actually is very sure I think the, the speaker have covered shield pattern and invention before checking if there's actually a market or needs for it. The answer is yes. Do your market research and see whether it aligns mm -hmm. with your business strategy. And I think um, uh, there's a question about how is, how is it important to do a freedom to operate search before you launch a new product? Is it important? <laughs> I feel like hearing Victor's view on this one. I have my own view, but freedom search. You mean that to do a search, right? Yeah, to do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think earlier I touched a little bit on that. Is that uh, it's very important to to me? I feel it's pretty important at least to do some due diligence on that. Uh, at least you do your homework, and also sometimes I think by doing so, it actually triggers certain uh ideas to you because you know by trade uh, by understanding on certain research, right? You will, under, you will start to see the trend. What are the things that people start to patent? What are the things that is, uh, is already patent and trigger certain ideas from you? So you know the directions that uh, uh, where to go. This is one. And also at the same time, you know what is happening in the market. So there is uh, a lot of benefits of doing that, not just about doing a search to protect yourself, but also understanding the trend. Yeah. So this is yeah. my view, Dixon. <laughs> I think it's a very business sense of, a very sensible view itself. My, my, mine is not far itself. Most of the time, I think the question of whether should I do a, a FTO only appears after the product is done, which is, I think, the major problem for me. Because what's going to happen if you hit a jackpot? What I'm going to do? I, 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 I there's a limited option I can do it for you, you see. So I think before you go into the R&D stage to create something and everything else, it's good to really have one simple one done. Like what Victor said, what's the space like? Who are they? And things like that. What's, what's out there? Because by understanding that, you also know that, okay, uh, how... I'll give you this example. It's like, uh, play when you know those days we work with a pattern analytics team. And when we look at the pattern space itself, uh, there are a lot of readings you can, you can pick up from there. If... If, if this sector of the, of, the, of the technology, right, is filled with all IHL uh, applicants, okay? So PhD and stuff, everything else. Uh, this is likely to be a nascent, play, uh, nas nascent uh, stage of the technology because uh, as PhD uh, requirement, my understanding of my colleagues those days is that you need to be new, but you, you don't know whether you apply to commercial world later or in other world itself, but you file it first. There's a requirement for that in some university. So you know that it's nascent. But when you see... A, a whole group of patents that are owned by, uh, I mean, uh, commercial entity that are easily identified in the market, like Sony, Dyson, whatever. And all, most of these patents uh, have like five to six years left. Likely, this type of technology is going to sunset. And you look at where, where it's next from there to research. When you see a good mix of uh, commercial entity and also IHL, you can see interest is coming. Because both commercial are also looking at it, they may have bought over or got license from some of the IHL also. You can actually sense a bit of where it is. Then when you have that space before you start, you had planned first and start, okay, just we don't crystal ball absolutely to the future, but you look at okay, this is the pattern space at least. How it looks like, the technology roughly, okay, fine. It seems okay. No prior art somehow. Okay, that's something we can do. 
and you want to build your project timeline based on a, a quick, fast to market kind of situation, right. then before you launch, right, you do another scan. You have to do that anyway because things can develop. Because I don't know how long it took to develop your, your product. In between, someone might, might have the again the same brilliant mind and develop something before you and found it there. Mm. So you, you have to look, watch it in, in that sense. Like. I think that's why I think FTO is important, but how you do it, at which stage right, you put in, how much resources, that will be a strategic conversation you need to have with your IP strategist. Right. So I think um, today actually a very key takeaway for myself or, and I hope from the audience is that a lot of time when we talk about IP protection, it's really about how you align with your business needs, um, your business strategy, and you know even the filing strategy depends on which market you want to go in and which market do you think is big enough for, for you to enter. And so I think we are we are really like over our one hour and we have still a lot of questions, but uh, I really have to apologize that we couldn't answer all the questions. But um, if you have any questions to ask Dixon and Victor, um, do, do feel free to connect with them directly. We have shared their LinkedIn um, profile over here. And also IPOS International is providing complimentary IA chat sessions for innovative enterprises who require some kind of guidance for their IAIP journey. So you can um, sign up uh, via the link or scan the QR code. Or if you want us to connect um, with, uh, help you connect with Dixon, uh, uh, do let us know as well. So uh, before you know we go, uh, can I get you to do a feedback poll as well to help us understand a bit better how we can improve or what are the topics that you would like to see in the future. So uh, so while we are launching that, we are also sharing some of the information about how you can sign up for the IE chat session. Uh, you know, if you can share the link of our Dixon and Victor LinkedIn profile on our chat box so that they can see, it would be good as well. All right, so uh, with that, uh, please help us to do the poll. And once again, my name is Pei Wen, and on behalf of Dixon and Victor, we'd like to thank you for spending an hour with us, and we look forward to seeing you at another IP Expert Series event soon. All right, have a good day, everyone. Thank you for your participation. Thank you, Victor and Dixon, for the good sharing. Thank you for having us here. <laughs> right, and I, I think there is really a lot of uh, questions. So. <laughs> so if they... Connect with you directly or do to help them with those questions. <laughs>